Welcome to the campus of North Idaho College and today's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Today we wish to discuss with you the topic, Sex in Society, Contrast in Human Behavior. In order to accomplish that, we are very privileged to have on our program an expert in that field. Our guest today is Mary Lee Neal Tatum, who is a professional educator, lecturer, author, and consultant on this subject. Our guest has uh, received national recognition for her work in this field with such appearances as those on 60 Minutes, uh, Today Show, and Good Morning America. She has also uh, been consulted uh, with, for her work with such organizations as various churches, the Southern Baptist, the Episcopal and Presbyterian churches in our country. Our guest holds a baccalaureate degree from the University of Washington and a master's degree from George Mason University. At the present time, she works in uh, sexual education and family life uh, in Virginia at Falls Church at the George Mason High School, but she also has taught and given workshops at various universities, including the University of Virginia. Uh, Mary Lee, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our program and to our city and to our campus. Thank you, Tony. I'm happy to welcome to the panel today to question our guest on this very important subject. First of all, regular panelist who has been with me on this subject before and many others, and happy to have her back, as always, uh, Mary Lou Reed, who uh, will commence a question in a moment. And we also have uh, Margaret Peggy Feggie, who is in the Counseling Center at North Idaho College, and Joe Marinovich, who is in charge of the health care of our campus and uh, in the health center. We shall proceed to the questioning with Mary Lee Reed. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Mary Lee, this morning before the North Idaho College students, you said that you think that the United States uh, is an anti-sexual culture. What brings you to this conclusion? Why are we <laughs> anti-sexual when we see so many sexual things bef on the television and in our newsstands? Mm -hmm. I think first we probably have to define what we mean as sexual. And when you say sexuality um, in this culture, we usually mean something very um, superficial, uh, very physical, very without relationship, intimacy, etc. And um, when uh, Americans avoid, uh, like they, as they do, the subject of sexuality as the basic sense of who they are, their identity. Um, how they relate as men and as women, uh, and instead go to a flippant kind of view of Playboy penthouse and, uh, and jokes and uh, X-rated movies and things. Then we find, uh, I find it very easy to call it anti-sexual because it really is a screen and it keeps us from dealing with our own sexuality adequately. Do you think we're a superficial culture in that sense or are we just naive about understanding? of our, our own identities. Maybe I would almost use the word fearful of dealing honestly and openly with our sexuality. We have very heavy sex roles and if we really begin questioning that sense of who we are, we might have to question some of the heavier sex roles that we have um, in that we might have to come to a mutuality in our relationships between men and women and men and men and women and women. And to some degree it's easier to avoid this and so we do this in this fairly flippant way. Yes, and it's really well illustrated by young adolescents who, when you begin talking seriously about sexuality with them, they're very giggly and very nervous. Ill at ease. And we carry a lot of that into our adult lives with us, that, that unease that we feel. Uh, the, the young adolescent, we say, feels uneasy because they are attaining manhood and attaining womanhood and a bit insecure about that, but they're beginning to believe that many adults are as well. Parents, certainly. Yes. <laughs> Peggy Feggy. This morning also in your, your talk you spoke about the difference between sex education, learning about sex, and learning about loving. Could you tell us a little bit about what do you see as sex education? What does it involve? Um, well, when, when I spoke this morning, I was talking about sexual learning taking place from birth to death in our whole and total environment, that we learn who we are as sexual beings from affectional relationships within the family primarily, and then later as we branch out into other relationships. That, spe that very special intervention, which is sex education, which comes at specific times um, for uh, young people and for adults as well, 
really means giving information and an opportunity to confront the issues, the values issues and the decision making skills in specific ways. For instance, in, with young adults, uh, we, we would be very different in the confrontations and the content than we would be with kindergarten. But it may be important that at kindergarten level, we talk a little bit about what families are and how special they are, which would, might be a prelude to some other more age-appropriate things later. Okay. Joe Marinovich. Mary Lee, um, what pressures are placed on children and teenagers by the media, by their peers, and by their parents? Uh, regarding sexuality? Um, I think primarily, uh, as I see it in young adolescents, um, the idea of will I ever be able to be like that? Will I ever be able to model the, uh, the male that's used in advertising, the, the Joe Namath image? Will I ever be able to uh, be like that person? Um, Seventeen Magazine probably is a beautiful example of wonderful uh, articles, well written, telling kids to make good decisions, be mature, don't go steady, obey your parents, don't stay out late, etc. But the advertising all says, there's something wrong with you, buy our product and you'll look like this model and have that boy to take you to the prom. So there's a tremendous uh, influence of what the ideal is. And the ideal in American advertising and on television is virtually unreachable because it isn't real even for the people who are playing those roles. And I think that's a tremendous pressure. Uh, the idea that everybody is sexually active, et cetera, uh, those things are simply not true. Mary Lee, I want to try to come up with a very clear question. It's quite complex, and it has to do with the definition of human sexuality. Oftentimes in our society, from what you have indicated in your presentation today, that we misunderstand what the term sexuality means or, or the use that we're giving of it. And maybe that I can be of assistance in my question by taking the thesis that there has appeared to be two major positions taken on this issue, one by a much more conservative philosophy that is quite inflexible and rigid, indicating we should not even discuss the issue, and they oppose sex education. Mm -hmm. uh, and they also have a long list of do's and don'ts and are very judgmental concerning the issue. There has been a reaction to that, if I'm correct, in which some individuals have said to counter that, that uh, there should be total and open freedom and that one should uh, have self-gratification at all times. Do you subscribe to either one of these positions or is there another position? And in answering that, maybe you can take some time to give us your definition of what is human sexuality. Very simple question. <laughs> 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 I think um, that I do not subscribe to either one of those uh, places that you described. I'm, I do not believe that sexuality has very much to do with a rigid set of do's and don'ts. That has more to do with behavior imperatives based on some kind of philosophy. Uh, the uh, other other side of the coin, the hot tub, uh, anything goes kind of set, and I don't, I'm not putting down hot tubs, they're wonderful, but <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that um, I really believe that uh, American values and American morals at their best are really pretty good, and that is that we believe people ought to care about each other, ought to love and be responsible. Uh, we really think that our society ought to help itself to be as free from uh, dire social problems as possible as in adolescent pregnancy where we have um, 1.3 million teenage pregnancies and the majority of those who keep their babies end up with a third party support payment and go on and on with the horror statistics. All of those kinds of things. Most people agree we should do something about those things. Now obviously sex education is not going to going to answer all those problems. It's only going to be one aspect of it. But a good sense of sexuality, of who we are as men and women, what my identity is from birth to death, that I am sexual from birth to death, um, that I am a man or a woman, that I am growing and progressing, and uh, that my attractions and my caring and my affections are what they are, and that it's okay, I am me. And because I'm being responsible and loving and caring, uh, that's who I am. And I guess that really, that broader, that's why we're using the word sexuality, I think, more than sex, because sex itself seems like a clipped word that implies genital sex. And sexuality seems to encompass our total lives. But I don't want to leave out the fact that physical sexuality is a part of the definition of sexuality. I think that, that too, is a danger to get so spiritual that we're no longer real in this, in this area. Let's pursue this one step further before we turn to the panel. And dealing with this definition you just have given of human sexuality, how can individuals become uh, more free in their thinking or 
feel less guilt to deal with, uh, as you've indicated today, different kind of relationships. And I'm not speaking of uh, that all relationships are those in which uh, it has the uh, past definition of human sexuality. In other words, how can you relate to different individuals and yet, as an individual, have your, your privacy or your intimacy reserved uh, for uh, your choice of, of an individual? Can you explain a little more what we mean by that process as you've indicated to our students today? By the general feelings of being a sexual being right. and feeling infatuations and feeling wonderfully responsive as a woman or a man to a variety of people. And I, that is a human experience. And there is a lot of guilt in that because our message has been if you have the thoughts, then those thoughts are, well, it's sort of the Jimmy Carter lust in your heart idea. <laughs> um, it sort of, if I have these thoughts in my heart, then I, I have some kind of, I, I mean, I had a lot of sympathy with Jimmy Carter on that statement because he was saying, in effect, the end of the sentence was, but I don't act on it. And that, I really think, is an important thing to say. And we ought to celebrate those wonderful feelings that we have and help kids to celebrate them and say, yes, sexual feelings exist and we, we do feel, it's wonderful to feel like a man or feel like a woman. And, um, and then, behavior and commitments are, an are not an entirely different thing, but they are a different thing. And uh, infatuations do not mean that we have to act on how we're feeling. Um, so that our learning as we grow up would be to accept ourselves for who we are sexually and that we are sexually responsive and that we even get little chills and thrills sometimes uh, from when we encounter people where it would be perfectly inappropriate to have any kind of behavior change a pattern and that that's okay. Um, but when we fall in love, when we get about the good business of being in love, the hard work and the commitment that that takes to stay with someone for a period of time, is a, is a challenge and also a beautiful thing, but a different thing. In other words, infatuations do not have to lead to lovemaking or to marriage or to even to going steady, but they can be there. And, and if we help children to celebrate them instead of putting them down and saying, oh, that's just puppy love or oh, that's just infatuation where the child learns to suppress all of that, then they don't know what to do with it when they do get the feelings. And I think that's very dangerous. Thank you. Lou Reed. Well, you have said that we are sexual from birth till death. And uh, how can parents accept that message? And how can, they, how can they live with it and share that with their children and understand it? Interesting question, Lou. I think, um, I think it has, again, to do with our definition of sexual, that part of the reason we reject that is because we see sexuality as something other than beautiful and wonderful and a human part of ourselves. And we see that little baby, we say that baby is innocent. And we see the young child, and we say the child is naive. And then when we see the, the scarlet woman, we say, she knows what time it is. And it's almost as if having had intercourse means that your whole life has changed and that you are now can no longer return to being the virgin queen. You're not innocent, in, yeah. Yes, exactly. The, the other issue is that women themselves go from being virgin daughters to being mothers and are not encouraged to be their sexual selves in our society so that they think their sexuality always has to be linked up with something to do with relationship with men. Well, how can we change this, this particular perception? I mean, obviously it is not the healthiest one. Do you have, do you have methods other than sex education in which you feel, um, as I say, parents, um, individuals, can begin to look at things in a new way? Well, I, th I think it has to be a multiple approach, and one of the most important ones would obviously be some influence on the media. Uh, and there are very few people who are having a lot of influence on the media. There's some real efforts, something called the Center for Population Options has a television project which actually gets producers together and explains to them some of the issues in adolescent sexuality and in young adult sexuality and some of the ways in which they portray men and women on television which are very destructive because the kids see it over and over and over again. That's one, one uh, prong of the solution. I th there have to be many. It has to be, uh, we have to do a lot of parent education and uh, clinic people need to talk with kids who come in for uh, uh, pregnancy tests and for other problems, and uh, it's, it's a multiple problem. It's a very good question. Before we continue the program, ladies and gentlemen, if you've entered uh, late in the program, our guest is Mary Lee Tatum, who is a professional educator, lecturer, 
author and consultant on sexual education or human sexuality, and she's been visiting our campus today to speak on this subject. She's had many appearances on such programs as 60 Minutes and Good Morning America and Today Show. We shall continue the questioning with Peggy Fedgie. Continuing on Mary Lou's train of thought, if indeed we are sexual beings from the, the day we're born onward, who do you see as responsible for guiding that sexual learning? What persons or institutions and, and kind of evaluate the job they're doing now and what maybe we could do a little better? Well, basically from birth, the parent, the primary family is the sex educator, so to speak, of the child. And um, although we, there's a lot of debate about what is, what is learned and what is innate, and I don't want to get into that, but I think that uh, that basic sexual learning does take place within the family confines, the, uh, not only in affection and stroking and loving, but respecting, and, uh, uh, and the parent telling the child uh, that they are good and wonderful as a man or a woman, and the parent uh, exhibiting to the child the, the respect between the sexes and the caring and loving in the family. Now, it would be nice if all sexual learning was that positive. Unfortunately, it isn't. Um, but uh, for better or for worse, the family is the primary uh, educator at that point. Um, the other end of the spectrum, which is rarely talked about, is sex and the aging. And uh, again, after we get this innocent little baby and this naive child, then we go post-menopausally to men and women and we say, well, they're old, they're grandparents, they're uh, gray and overweight and they no longer have any sexual feelings. And in fact, we have carried that to such an extreme that we very often take a couple who have lived together for 60 or 65 years and have known the comfort and warmth of each other's bodies. They become infirm. We put them in different wings of a nursing home and they never see each other again and they die. Now that's changing because we've said, oh, we have been uh, inhumane in that sense. But that has been an American way of doing things. We simply do not see anyone as sexual unless they are of that reproductive age, uh, where because that means that women have a legitimate reason to be sexual, they can be mothers. Joe Marinovich. Uh, Mary <coughs> Lee, this morning you mentioned the human need for touching and how important it was, and um, uh, the way the American society sort of puts that off in the background, too. Um, also, you did mention that teenagers um, um, had some problems with that. Would you like to? Yes, and I knew that you agreed with me, too. <laughs> <laughs> teenagers uh, exhibit touch deprivation, I think. Uh, there's a frenetic kind of energy that is looking for touch to uh, allow them to get in touch with some kind of reality in, in their physical selves and beings. Um, and that touch deprivation often comes because of fear on the part of parents for hugging and touching. And there's, you know, the family is supposed to be safe harbor. The father and the mother are the father and the mother, and the children are the children. And, it, and that's the way it is. Now, in, in, in normal situations, um, that is, in stable, uh, even vaguely stable homes, that's the way it is. There are lines drawn. Um, and so the hugging and the touching is just a wonderful add-on to that. It's in homes where there's some fear about who is the parent and who is the child. And, and that is in a dysfunctional area that that becomes scary. But we all adopt the issue and say, well, maybe I shouldn't still be hugging my little boy now that he's two inches taller than I am. Or maybe I shouldn't be hugging my little girl now that she is beginning to, to have breasts and looking like a sexual being. And of course, once you're a sexual being, which only happens at adolescence, uh, if I hug you, it's got to be a sexual thing instead of a loving, affectionate, compassionate, caring, parental child thing, which it is and should be at its best. So I have some really strong feelings about that. And as a teacher who works with young adolescents, I really would resent very much anyone telling me that I could not touch or hug my young friends because I am the teacher, the adult, the friend, and they are the child, the student, the friend. And there's no question in my mind about that. And I think families need to adopt that same feeling about their children. Merely, I hesitate to ask this question on such a short program because it is so involved. However, I will proceed uh, at that risk. You've also talked to our students concerning the historical background of the subject. And in this country, I suspect there is no subject that can cause more controversy than discussing sexual questions. Uh, and there must be some historical reason for that. There must be something in the cultural uh, background. Uh, could you take a moment to talk about, from a historical perspective, why people in this country have such a difficult time 
dealing with that uh, in their families uh, or in uh, school, wherever it may be, to even discuss uh, this question as we discuss other matters. Well, you're right, Tony. It's a very complex question. And without going back into too many thousands of years of history and to what happens to be the relationship between men and women and how that has progressed throughout the centuries, one could say that <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. One could say that um, that Victorian times have left us with a bad taste for sexual behavior in that women became the adored virgin queen or the adored mother and uh, men became the seducer or and I don't think became I think that that was building on a long history of those kinds of roles for men and women and so that we uh, came into this century with a sense of um, confusion about what it was to just be a person. And we, when we look back on Victorian times, what do we look at? Meet me in St. Louis, Louis at the fair, that wonderful family, or cheaper by the dozen, or mama and papa kind of things, and uh, M is for the million things she gave me. And a lot of uh, idealized views of men and women. And uh, so uh, because of that, and then the intervention of two world wars, which said put women and men in very different roles, and caused a lot of questions to be raised. And of course, this, we mustn't neglect the suffrage movement in the 20s and the fact that women have only had the vote in this country for 60 years, which isn't very much time in the history of men. And, uh, and of course, uh, there are many men who felt that women should have had the vote. I'm not doing this as an as a either or thing, as, as, which is part of the problem also, that we, we have learned from early childhood to mistrust the opposite sex. So when something goes wrong, the, the easiest thing to do is to blame the opposite sex. Isn't that just like a man? Isn't that just like a woman? And so we're sort of left with those feelings of hostility and distrust, and it's very difficult to overcome them. We also have a sense of guilt about sexuality because I think of a Judeo-Christian heritage which says that sex was a uh, woman the seductress and man who was not smart enough to resist the seduction so he was tortured by it all the time. Both very demeaning views of men and women. And uh, so now we have an opportunity I think in the 80s to begin to say because of a lot of, of socially liberating movements to begin to say where are men and where are women and there is a kind of mutuality in our relationships as friends as well. If, if you want a, a nice illustration of how confused this whole issue is, you might think for a moment about a woman, a young woman who uh, has a date to meet her girlfriend to go out for supper in a movie, and a young man calls for a date. And is there any question but what most of them would break the date with the girlfriend for supper in the movie and go out with a young man? Uh, there's a real premium put on opposite sex, potentially romantic relationships, and not so much premium put on friendships and that variety of relationship which is essential for our survival. No one person meets the needs of any one person. We need those varieties of friendships and relationships. But our history has really left us with the feeling that the ultimate is to meet romantically, uh, marry, and reproduce. <laughs> Thank you. Lou Reed. You've talked about the importance of touching. Would you talk a little bit about the importance of intimacy in our lives? The, uh, the question of isolation and, and what we're trying to do then in breaking down the barriers between men and women. Uh, that, it's very interesting that you ask that question right now, Lou, because uh, there's just a book off the press, the title of which I'm not even familiar with, but it's written by Linda Levine and Lonnie Barbach. And it's, it's a result of interviews with a lot of men who said, that the thing missing in their relationships with women was intimacy. And, what and do we mean by intimacy, meaning, really? Meaning that the total person relates to the total person. We have thought of intimacy as genital sex, and obviously it's not. There has to be a great deal more than that. If, if that were true, then rape would be an intimate experience, um, and certainly it isn't. So our intimacy is that capacity to be direct. I have a, 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 a theory that there are two ways adults and adolescents make decisions about relationships. One of them is unilateral. That says, what do I want out of this relationship and what are my needs and how am I going to manipulate the situation to get my needs and wants met? The other is a communicative uh, way of decision making which says well let's sort of move alongside here and see if this relationship can go and what it might mean to us and being sensitive to each other gradually letting the relationship evolve either together or apart 
and that those are the sensitive, caring kinds of relationships that create an intimacy that says, I can be honest with you because I trust you, and you can be honest with me because you trust me. So trust is the basis. I think so, because you can't make communicative uh, decisions and have a communicative relationship unless there's caring and trust and a mutual respect. Um, you go back to the unilateral manipulative thing and when you are manipulating someone you're not respecting them as a person. And you're overcoming the fear of the loss of your own identity by yeah. trusting someone else? Yes, and that's very hard to do because we have to build walls around ourselves so that we won't look foolish. That's, a, that's an excellent uh, way to state that. Um, the, uh, if, if we do just plain trust, someone might not take care of us. But we need it. Mm -hmm. We need intimacy. We right. need it desperately. Peggy Petty. How can teachers and counselors and those of us in the education world help promote the kind of intimacy and uh, thinking of ourselves as sexual beings, how can we promote that in our children and adolescents? Any words of wisdom for in us? In the clients that you serve? In, in, I guess I'm looking at this from the viewpoint of an educator, that in our classrooms and in our counseling sessions, what can we do to help our students evolve into the kinds of trusting, intimate um, mm -hmm. people who have a very good feeling for themselves? The first thing that comes to mind is that we need to model that in the way we mm -hmm. relate to them, just as parents do that with their own children. That's sometimes hard because we have been accustomed to thinking that we have a rigid role to play as a helping professional and we must play it. And uh, if you think back on the people that you remember in your growing up years and your adolescence who were very important to you, it often, they often were not the people who taught you the best algebraic formula, but the person who really related to you as a human being and said, I respect you and like you. Are you also I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but we're out of time, and on this program, uh, the clock always wins. <laughs> Mary Lee Tatum, I want to thank you on behalf of our staff for being with us on campus and on uh, this program and sharing your views with our audience. I know that uh, they would join me in saying thank you. Thank you, Tony. It's been a pleasure. I also express my appreciation to the panel, as always, and uh, again today, outstanding questions. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Mary Lee Neal Tatum, who, as I indicated earlier in the program, is a professional educator, lecturer, author, on the subject of human sexuality. I hope that you've enjoyed this program, and I would like to take this opportunity to remind you once again that we are most eager and uh, are very happy when you write or call us concerning our programs and giving suggestions of what you would like to hear in the future on subjects that uh, we might not think about unless you inform us of your request. I would also like to suggest that you can do that by simply writing to this program, North Idaho College Public Forum, in care of Tony Stewart in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which is 83814, and we will take your uh, recommendations under serious consideration. Please have a good week, and I hope you'll be with us again next week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by a North Idaho College student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time. <laughs>